Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this call of the uh, Internet Society UK chapter. Uh, today, uh, well, first, my name is Olivier Crépin Blanc. I'm the chair of the chapter. Uh, we've got a couple of other people from the uh, ISOC uh, UK England team uh, with us uh, on, on the call, and I see there's quite a good turnout, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, today we have Derek Galvin from uh, DCMS, uh, who's going to speak to us about the UK consultation uh, on uh, IoT uh, security by design. Uh, this is a consultation that's open until the 5th of June, uh, so uh, there's still plenty of time to comment. And um, Derek has put together quite a, a set of slides to explain to us, take us through the whole process and what's in this consultation, what's in the documents that are uh, being presented for consultation. So I hope that you enjoyed this webinar and um, the way we'll structure this is to uh, start with Derek introduction, go through the slides and then after that uh, we'll have time for questions um, depending on, on how we're doing for time. Um, it shouldn't take more than an hour uh, but uh, let's see let's see how we go. So uh, that's basically it and uh, without any further ado I can turn it over to Derek Galvin. And by the way, just one last thing. If you're not speaking, please um, mute your, uh, your line. So there is a, a way in Zoom you can mute your microphone, bottom left-hand corner of the screen, um, and that will then ensure that we have good quality sound uh, for, uh, for everyone. So that's it. Thanks. Uh, Derek, over to you. Brilliant. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for diving in to listen to me today. Um, as previously said there, uh, the presentation is all about this consultation that we've re recently published on uh, regulatory proposals for consumer IoT security. Um, it's one of kind of the many pieces of work that the team here in DCMS uh, is taking uh, this year um, and kind of just the slide as well. It is very much a consultation. We're very well aware of that kind of the document itself doesn't have all the answers, as it were. We're aware that there's, you know, there's gaps here and there. Um, and kind of the consultation is a really good opportunity to, for, you know, associations in industry like yourselves to really flag to us kind of what are the key things we're missing? What are the unintended consequences? Um, what other things we should be looking at that hasn't been considered in the consultation? So kind of really welcome any sort of feedback you have both in this session and as well kind of in the formal feedback um, for the 5th of June deadline too. Um, so just on that note, if we go to uh, slide number two in the presentation, um, I just wanted to start off with what we set out in the consultation kind of constitutes consumer IoT. I know this is a bit of um, a controversial um, topic as it were, because you know a number of people with engagement both as part of the consultation and over the past you know, two years, there's wide ranging views of what constitutes consumer IoT. Um, we've defined it in the consultation as products that are connected to the internet and our home network. We're very well aware that if we want to put something into law, kind of the definition will need to be tightened up um, to precisely kind of um, avoid any unintended consequences that you know, we mandate, our intention is to mandate consumer IoT, but it ends up kind of having an effect on other sectors too. Um, so in the consultation document, we provided kind of a non-exhaustive list of examples, so kind of your standard children's toys, smart cameras, connected appliances, um, things like that. So kind of, just wanted to kind of set out our thought earlier on, kind of that's what we think is in scope, um, we've set out as well in the consultation what we don't feel is in scope, so things like consumer IoT, industrial IoT, things like that. But please do shout um, kind of later on in the session if kind of if we're missing something here or you have a better way of wording that or tightening up the definition, we'd really kind of welcome that. If we move on to slide three, um, all about the prevalence of consumer IoT. So as you're no doubt aware, kind of, there's many, many surveys and studies out there at the moment, publicly available, that have kind of um, different pieces of data and statistics on, you know, the uptake of consumer IoT and smart devices, both in the home and outside. In the consultation, um, one of the many we've used, if 
inclusive of common survey uh, from last year. So it's got kind of a, a decent sample size, about 3,700 consumers, um, kind of surveying all about kind of the most prevalent um, connected devices in their home. So kind of some really striking stats from that was, you know, 42% of households survey so they had a smart TV, you know, you see 20% of the wearable device, 13% smart speakers. Um, and kind of at the bottom there, you know, some estimate that device ownership is going to go from, you know, 10 devices up to 15 devices just in the next 12 months alone. So kind of what I'm trying to get across with this slide is, you know, in a nutshell, uh, IoT, really fast growing and emerging market. They're going in the home. Um, a lot of people are using them, which is great. If we move on to slide four. Kind of, and where kind of our conversation is focused on is all around kind of the negative things associated with that. So with a really booming and emerging market, there's then the opportunity for insecure products to kind of flood the market too. Um, so as I've mentioned there, kind of to give you an idea of kind of the kind of market failure and kind of scenario we're dealing with is, I think it's widely accepted. There's large numbers of devices sold on the market that, you know, lack even basic cyber security. Um, you know, the result of that is privacy, safety being undermined, and as well, consumers can't differentiate between products that have good or bad security, as it were. If we go into slide five, um, as well, kind of, in a lot of our engagements, you know, time and time again, uh, we heard from, you know, stakeholders, manufacturers, or retailers going, we're not sure consumers actually care about their security as well. They kind of they buy the device, they just want to make sure it works. Um, that's why we commissioned um, a survey of nearly six and a half thousand participants here in the UK um, earlier this year. Um, some really interesting pieces come out of it. So for example, 49% of those surveyed consider security features to be important in the decision making process. And that's only behind you know the cost of the device and the functionality too. So that's higher than things like battery life. Um, other things like that. Um, of those 51% that didn't say, you know, it's important to them, 72% believe that, you know, security is already built into the device by design, um, which is really striking and kind of something that backs up uh, what we're finding time and time again is that consumers, they're not really aware of, you know, the security of the device because, you know, they're buying it from a reputable brand, a reputable store. They already think, you know, everything is sorted out, everything is safe to use, uh, and all that, and that's all been taken care of. Interestingly enough, and why I've included this last bullet point, is we've heard as well from manufacturers that, okay, consumers can, you know, care to a degree about security, but they're not necessarily going to want to pay anything extra for security as well. So, on average, 59% uh, surveyed were willing to pay a premium of 5%. For a smart product with a security label over an equivalent product without one. I'll come on more about security labels and stuff later on in the presentation. Uh, and this drops to 40% participants at a price premium of 10% too. Um, on slide six, um, as I said previously, we launched a consultation on the 1st of May. Um, it was uh, well received here in the UK in the press. There was quite a lot of press pickup too. Um, and kind of touched on what we've been hearing kind of time and time again and heard from our uh, consultation we launched last year on our Secure Design Report that people want some sort of regulation in this space. Um, and kind of they think it's up to government to kind of define what that should look like. Um, we move on to slide seven. Uh, so what have we actually published as part of the consultation? So we've published kind of four main documents. The first one is the consultation document itself. Um, we affectionately call this the easy read because it's only about 20 pages long. It kind of sets out what our proposal is, what our rationale is behind that, and importantly as well, kind of the questions for you guys that you know we need to fill our evidence gaps. Um, the second bullet point there is the consultation stage regulatory impact assessment document. Now this is quite a large technical documents with a lot of, you know, costs and figures and analysis in there. Um, primarily, this is the kind of sort of document that internals for us 
and the policy side of things that we're going to be kind of filling out uh, and creating um, and then putting to kind of you know senior senior levels within government to get clearance on before we can progress in any sort of you know next steps on legislation and we've also included as well um, some kind of consumer surveys and online studies work um, kind of free to use um, for kind of other government departments or kind of industry too kind of draw upon kind of the different um, kind of uh, different kind of results in the surveys we've got so kind of I'll be referring to this Harris Interactive survey quite a bit um, it's all available on the gov.uk website so feel free to kind of have a look there click through it um, there's a number of kind of really bits of interesting evidence in there that I won't run through in this um, presentation but kind of really enjoy you to take a look at. On slide eight, um, kind of, I've kind of set the scene in kind of what we've published, what kind of we see the problem as, uh, and kind of now next steps, kind of what's our approach to regulation. So we recognize, for example, our code of practice that we published last year. It's a voluntary document, it's 13 principles in it that we see as good practice. It's also now formed the basis of a new SD technical standard that was published in February this year. Um, this kind of um, code of practice, uh, we've listened to kind of industry, we've listened to stakeholders and experts. Everyone agrees, you know, this is good practice. It's kind of it's hitting the right notes. It's a sensible approach. But when it comes to regulation, if you mandate all 13, you know, guidelines just outright immediately, that's going to place an incredibly heavy burden on manufacturers and retailers. Uh, by that, I mean as well, you know, going further than that, you know, the supply chains that they have, things like non compliant stock in their warehouses, we're well aware that, you know, stakeholders have raised, raised concerns to us before, saying if you go really ha heavy handed with regulation, you know, that's going to impact on growth and dampen innovation. On to slide nine. Um, here, it's important to kind of as well flag up, you know, the consultation. We're consulting on what we want to mandate and how we want to mandate that too. So we kind of really welcome on the 5th of June kind of your responses on both sides of that. So if you go to slide 10 as part of what we want to mandate, kind of from our perspective, it's coming up with a practical solution, you know, the criteria being it can be implemented sooner. Uh, because we're aware that the market failure is happening now. It, any kind of solution will go towards protecting consumers, the wider economy, and as well ensures growth across the sector and doesn't dampen innovation. So that's where we come up with this wording around an effective minimum baseline that kind of finds that right balance between both. Therefore, our proposal is that the focus should be placed on aspects of the top, top three guidelines within our code of practice for consumer IoT security. So if we go into slide 11, what are those aspects of the top three guidelines? So as we set out in the consultation, you know, the first one is basically no more default passwords in products. So the IT device password on it must be unique, not resettable to any universal factory setting. Uh, guideline two, so manufacturers of IT devices need to provide a public point of contact as part of a vulnerability exposure policy. Um, around that, the IoT Security Foundation back in, I believe it was November or December 2018, published a really interesting piece of work all about vulnerability disclosure policy with manufacturers and smart devices. The findings of that, I think they did a business survey. The kind of findings of that report was that uh, I think it was over 91% of manufacturers survey have no form of vulnerability disclosure policy in place at all. So, you know, there's, in most cases, there's no uh, mechanism through which either an IoT security researcher or a member of the public who comes across a vulnerability is able to report that to the company and get it fixed. So what we're proposing is a public point of contact. Now, it was really interesting when our Minister for Digital, Margot James, launched this consultation on the 1st of May, uh, launched it to um, uh, an IoT conference here in London that one of the questions around this guideline too was fantastic that you're mandating that a public contract should be in place 
But should you be mandating to go one step further and that not only are you mandating that the public phone in contact to report the vulnerability, but also mandate that the vulnerability disclosure is actioned within a certain time period. Now, we're welcome to feedback on that as well. Um, what we'd really like in that instance, for example, is in your formal feedback and is set out your rationale for that and how that would work in practice. Like how does, if you come across vulnerability disclosure before in your respective industries and in your respective organizations, how does that actually work in practice? You know, what kind of given, you know, reasonable deadline for the manufacturer to actually action it um, and either fix the problem or action a vulnerability disclosure policy with specific steps um, towards fixing the problem. And then around guideline three, uh, and kind of we fully acknowledge kind of this guideline has been kind of the more controversial of the three um, throughout kind of the consultation process. This is all about manufacturers explicitly stating the minimum length of time for which the product will receive security updates. Um, this is all about being transparent with the consumer. And kind of the message we're trying to hit here is if a consumer goes into the shop, buys a product, and they don't know the product will only receive security updates for the next six or 12 months, kind of after that period of time, the device won't receive those updates anymore. The device, the device then could be vulnerable in a year or two time, and the consumer will be none the wiser. So all we want to kind of hit with that kind of guideline is literally for the manufacturer and the product just to be upfront with the consumer and say, this is how long the, the product will receive security updates for. If we go to slide 12, um, in terms of what we see as the benefit of touching on these three particular requirements. So from an enforcement perspective, kind of, our assumption, having engaged as well with kind of relevant stakeholders, is that these top three are actually quite easy to test. So the products and the companies either meet these requirements or they don't. You know, your manufacturer has a, a point of contact or they don't. The device has the default password or it doesn't. Um, it wouldn't be an onerous job by the enforcement body or the compliance body to test whether the product kind of meets these three requirements. We also think that kind of these top three, they're practical and implementable as well. And they'd also help to protect consumers from kind of significant attacks. I've mentioned there about transparency in the sector too, and as well I've touched that last one point around the clear feedback mechanism as well um, between the research community or the public and the manufacturers themselves. If we go on to slide 13, um, as I've mentioned previously, we're not only consulting on what we want to mandate, so those top three, but also how we deliver it. So if we go into the next slide, slide 14, these are our regulatory options that we set out within the consultation document themselves. Right? Um, and this is really where kind of your feedback, both on the 6th of June, if you have any immediate things now, is really welcome. Um, if I just kind of quickly run through them. So option A, this is kind of the labeling option. So in this space, we be mandating retailers to only sell IoT products that have an IoT security label on them. Manufacturers would self-declare. We've purposely left that wording high level as well because we'd welcome your feedback on how that kind of self-declaration process would work, what, the, what kind of steps the manufacturers have to take, and also your view on whether that process would actually work in practice. Would manufacturers, you know, um, would they be honest about kind of what they're declaring? Um, would, you know, would the kind of different declaration pro processes be robust enough to kind of hit the target too or hit the mark? Kind of, we've left it perfectly high level and really welcome your feedback on that. Um, option B is basically just mandate the top three outright. So you mandate your retailers to only sell the products that are to the top three guidelines. Once again, manufacturers self-declare, and we're open to as well kind of what you see as how, uh, how that self-declaration process would work, and would it work. Um, and the product would have to adhere to the top three guidelines, code of practice, and now as well, uh, that SE technology. 
standards. Um, and then option D, um, as part of the impact assessment, um, kind of we have to include a more heavy-handed option too. So this would be mandating retailers to only sell products with a label that evidence, evidence is compliant with all 13 guidelines of that code of practice and SE technical specification. And the manufacturers then would have, again, have to self-declare that and ensure the label is on the appropriate packaging. Um, if we go on to slide 15, the next slide, uh, I just want to quickly focus on um, why are we saying we should mandate retailers and not just the manufacturers themselves? So in that previously referenced Harris Interactive Survey, um, of the participants, 37% uh, ranked retailer websites as their main source, main source for purchasing smart devices, followed by 33% for the retailer stores themselves. Uh, the 65 plus category uh, are the most likely to actually go into a retail store when purchasing smart devices. Um, and just purchasing directly from the manufacturer, whether that be online or in-store, is just less common. And then also the obvious point too is, you know, a lot of these manufacturers are outside of the UK's legal jurisdiction. So kind of our approach has been, you stop it, at that point between it's sold to the consumer from the retailer store and you kind of stop at that store once it's in the country, it's a lot more effective than trying to essentially go outside of your own jurisdiction and mandate manufacturers that are abroad, whether that be you know in the EU or kind of uh, more abroad than that. We touch on slide 16, um, all around kind of option A, the label option, kind of why is the label an option in the first place? Uh, so from our perspective, kind of having engaged with loads and loads of consumers, whether that be, um, or sorry, kind of stakeholders, whether that be your manufacturers, your retailers, your security experts, your consumer groups too. So here in the UK, for example, which and consumers advi assistance advice would be the big two. Um, kind of, we're getting the same common themes coming out of those conversations. And those are kind of, consumers are expected to do the research themselves when they're purchasing the product, right? And many of them don't have the technical expertise to know necessarily kind of what they should be looking out for. And that's in a best case scenario where the consumer is proactively undertaking that research. So you can have a scenario where the consumer is being proactive and actually researching the product. They have a general idea of what they're actually looking for, but then they're still here with a stumbling block of a significant amount of manufacturers don't actually provide this information online on their website or within the product documentation themselves. Um, so one of the uh, documents that we published as well um, on the GovUK website for the consultation that I mentioned previously in this presentation was the fourth bullet point was all about that IoT uh, labeling survey and that was testing kind of how easily available information is online for the consumer. So the whole point of having a label is to allow the consumer to make more informed purchasing decisions. You know, they know what they're buying. Uh, they don't have to either proactively seek it out. They don't, and kind of a good, good example of that is speaking to consumer organizations, they raise an example of, you know, some manufacturers, um, if you want that information, you have to literally write to the manufacturer to a, you know, a letter PO box or something like that. So if I'm the consumer, I, and I practically want that information, I, I have to write off, I have to wait a couple of weeks and then come back to me, and then for the manufacturer then to come back, that process could take weeks rather than days. And kind of, it doesn't fit in, and it's not realistic that the consumer wants to buy the product either now or relatively soon. And if you're asking them to basically delay on that and go to kind of the proper channels, it, it, in practice, it's just unrealistic and doesn't work. So if we go on to slide 17, all about the label as an option. Um, so option A, we're mandating retailers to only sell products that have the label. The way we're pitching to do it is to have a positive or a negative label. So and it does exactly what it does in the gin as it were, kind of, you know, the positive label, um, hits the mark, the product you hear to the top three things, you get your positive label on it. If it doesn't, it gets the negative with a big red cross through it. Um, 
presented to a tech association last week, and they were saying, well, could you mix and match, match the labels too? You know, could you have a positive essential security features included with that shield, but then also have a negative software update, security updates not provided shield as well? I mean, in theory, you could, um, and we'd be kind of very much open to feedback on that too, whether you see something like that working. Um, what we're trying to get across here is that you can still technically sell the product with a negative label on it, but the idea is, you know, no manufacturer or retailer wants to be selling something with a red cross on it that could be deemed insecure. And so by mandating that it has to have a label on it, whether that be positive or negative, you're affecting the kind of manufacturer behavior and the retailer behavior, kind of influencing it down the supply chain then getting to a point where everyone wants a positive label on it and will make the necessary changes to get that positive label. As well as a flag as well um, in the consultation, our ambition is that the label, if we go with this scenario, would be signposted both on the physical products themselves, so on the packaging, and also on the product website. We're really interested to hear your feedback in your formal uh, feedback for the 50 tune, kind of if you think that's a reasonable approach, We've heard feedback before saying you're better off just putting it on the product website. Um, it's more cost effective for manufacturers, stuff like that. Um, and it's more effective reaching the consumer. If, for example, you feel the same way as that, it'd be really interesting to hear kind of whether you have any evidence to support that rationale and that assertion too. There's kind of, I briefly mentioned kind of that final stage impact assessment, big mega document that we're up to be submitting internally to the policy side of things. You know, when we're setting out the pros and cons of these things, we need hard evidence to back it up to. That's why kind of I'd really plead and implore with you, as part of your response, if you have any evidence um, to kind of back up what you're saying, we'd really welcome that. And if it's confidential evidence too, for example, um, all responses will be treated confidential, uh, confidentially. Uh, they're not kind of open to FOI requests. They're exempt under that when we're publishing our kind of final consultation response in a few months' time, it'll be a very high-level response, touching on the themes of the consultation feedback and things like that. We wouldn't be naming companies or naming specific pieces of data that can identify the companies or anything like that. Um, but if, for example, you have any concerns over sharing data or anything like that, please do get in touch with either myself or the Secure by Design mailbox that I'll be mentioning later on in the presentation. Um, in the first instance, and we can happily work with you to kind of um, send the information in a way that you're comfortable with. If we just quickly then go on to uh, slide 18. So why these specific labeling designs? So they're backed up by kind of extensive evidence as well that we've done. So that previously mentioned consumer survey, 92% of consumers stated that these designs were the best designs to label. Highest alternative option, so a padlock, was suggested by less than 1%, which is quite a stark um, difference, really. Um, and kind of, for us, that kind of gave us the clear thing that yeah, consumers will understand the labels and they prefer the labels, um, the designs that they are, sorry. Um, around kind of trademark requirements, too, we're very uh, well aware of things like these generic icons. We've been throughout this process working with uh, government uh, specialist lawyers on it when it comes to trademarking and intellectual property and stuff like that. If you have any feedback on that yourself, um, please be sent through. We'd really welcome that. Uh, if we're going to the next slide on slide 19, I won't spend too much time on this. Basically, you know, how do you qualify for that positive product label? As I mentioned before, you hit those top three. Um, Retailers need to ensure that the manufacturer has a point of contact in place within the manufacturer's organization as well um, for guideline two. Um, yeah, that's all about how you can qualify for it. Won't spend much time on that. If we go to the next slide on page 20, this is a really kind of important piece too that I want to get across. Um, we recognize that, you know, before any legislation comes into place, industry will need a grace period. Uh, and that's really, you know, to get the houses in order, uh, well aware we've listened to industry feedback, but, you know, things like supply chain contracts, they don't run year on year. These, these can be multi-year contracts. If in, legislation comes into effect 
halfway through a contract that can be extremely costly um, for either your manufacturer or your retailer uh, down the supply chain. So based on that, and based on feedback we received, um, kind of, we're going to set out later this year what the next steps are. Now, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it based on the feedback in this consultation. We're going to, you know, b between now and legislation coming into effect, um, we're going to run a, the label as a voluntary scheme. The idea of that is that's not necessarily saying kind of we're then going to look to mandate the label. We obviously have to listen to the feedback from the conversation themselves. But it's industry being clear, kind of, they want something in the meantime that can show them, you know, what good practice is and how to get their houses in order. Then when legislation comes into effect, they're not kind of bitten. Um, and they face kind of a lot of costs in excess stock and stuff like that. So later this year, we're on the label's voluntary scheme. We're going to use the feedback consultation to inform that too. Um, it's going to be consistent, whatever kind of option we proceed with. And kind of the key thing here is we're pitching for the voluntary scheme to run for at least two years. Um, it's a conscious decision to allow things like um, supply, chain, supply chain contracts and stuff to kind of run. And also for, you know, manufacturers and things like that, retailers, that's sufficient time to really do things like training staff, uh, repackaging or rebranding products and doing whatever you need to do on the kind of product development side to ensure those top three guidelines are kind of requirements are implemented within the device themselves. Um, if we go to the next slide, international approach as well is incredibly important. Um, we don't want to be in a position, and we're very conscious kind of industry as well doesn't want us to be in a position where we're doing all this on regulation, but it differs completely from what's actually happening in the rest of the world. That's why we want to ensure there's a cohesive global approach um, so that, for example, uh, companies selling into the UK aren't at a disadvantage compared to selling into other countries too. Um, so we're leading a lot of efforts in collaborating with international governments and industry partners. I mentioned before the FD technical specification, as well as public knowledge that we've also applied for it to become an EN standard. And we're also um, feeding into ISO standard development too. Um, I must admit, I'm not the one within the team leading on the standard side of things. So if you have any really technical questions for the standard side, please do bear with me. I'm more than happy to take it back to my colleague Jasper, who is very much the expert on this. So, um, and lastly as well, kind of, we're well aware, you know, things are going on at EU level too, in terms of like sales and goods directives and digital content directives. Um, we're very much plugged in the relevant teams across government here in the UK that are on those working groups and representing the UK. They're well aware of what our plans are. They're feeding that into the groups and they're also feeding us kind of what's happening at the group level too, just to ensure that what we're doing with our proposed regulation isn't wildly different to what's ha ha actually happening now with the rest of the world. Um, slide 22, I thought I'd throw this in as well, just to give you a flavor of what the reception's been and the consultation. So that same um, company who ran the previous consumer survey did kind of a snap survey after we published uh, of nearly 1,500 consumers. Um, getting their thoughts on a variety of issues specifically around the consultation. So the most kind of striking results there are 62% are concerned that their smart devices are a target for cyber attacks. 77% agree that these plans are set in the right direction. 65% of consumers would prefer the label option. Um, so that's all around transparency. 74% agree will help them make more informed decisions. So kind of, it's a good kind of lit litmus test from consumers that kind of, this would actually make a difference for what we're proposing. I would actually kind of help the consumer, you know, make an informed decision, things like that. Um, of course, like through the consultation and stuff like that, we welcome your feedback and industry feedback. Um, for example, if you really disagree, for example, with what the consumers are thinking and stuff like that, and if you foresee all these unintended consequences, we are more than happy to hear that too. Uh, really welcome it. Uh, which brings me on then to the next slide, slide 23. So how can you respond? Deadline is 5th of June, 11.59 p.m. UK time. Um, the easiest way to get your feedback to us is that mailbox there, secure by design at culture.gov.uk. 
Um, that way it goes into kind of one central mailbox. We're then able to kind of keep all the pieces of feedback in one place, action it as well, um, and kind of ensure that we don't miss anything. Which brings me then on to the next slide, kind of, I've included it, for me having done many government consultations before in previous roles and previous departments before this, kind of, first question, a lot of kind of people external to the government will say, or ask, would be like, what actually happens to this, you know, feedback that I'm submitting? As long as we spend all this time uh, submitting to you kind of detailed feedback, is anything going to actually happen or is government just going to go ahead and do what they want to do anyway? That's not the case. It's not a big box exercise. Um, our plan is basically review every single piece of feedback, both in that mailbox, in workshops or sessions like this, um, both with you know policy experts, technical experts as well, and NCSC, government legal experts, um, part safety experts, just to get a cohesive um, a approach for you pouring through it. Um, as well, importantly, you know, following the exercise two, once we've done that kind of mammoth um, analysis, uh, we'd very much like to, you know, follow up with specific respondents to kind of find out a bit more about what they're saying there, maybe test some ideas off of them, really involve you guys in the process too. Um, and yeah, as previously mentioned, we're going to publish uh, consultation response data this year, setting out our approach, um, and kind of that will be used not only to inform kind of our regulatory plans, but also kind of our voluntary plans too. Um, and yes, yeah, the work doesn't stop there. It brings me on then, so slide 25, consultation questions there, the document, I kind of park it there. Um, the uh, next few slides kind of just touch on the kind of the main themes of the questions we're asking. So, you know, things like our approach, what's your view on it, the labeling scheme as well, what's your view on it. Importantly, and I've mentioned before, the impact of our proposals. So, kind of any data about cost and impact on either kind of retailers or manufacturers or industry um, as well, we really welcome. Um, happy to receive them in a confidential basis too. And if you have any concerns about that, please let us know. We're more than happy to work with you to kind of get you to a place where you're comfortable sending that information to. Um, and then as well, we're really open in the conversation around these are our proposals for what we want to do, how we want to do it. But in terms of, you know, monitoring and enforcement, we, you know, we acknowledge and understand like that's a massive piece of work too in itself. We run, we're quite high level in this consultation about enforcement, how that would work. Um, obviously, we welcome your views. Simply on kind of how does it work in the space at the moment? How do you find it working? What do you think of the gaps? What do you think with current kind of legislation and stuff in place is either a burden, an unnecessary burden, or anything like that? And kind of what can we improve through this proposed legislation to not only kind of make industries' lives easier, but also get the desired effect of you know getting those insecure products off the market too? Kind of a park it there. Um, appreciate I've kind of just talked at you for quite a bit. I think it's important really kind of run you through kind of what we're trying to do, what's our rationale and things like that. And really emphasize kind of this is a consultation. It's not the final stage in the process. We're very early on in the process. And kind of um, we really welcome any comments or feedback on anything I've just talked about there or the consultation, either right now or at the fifth of June. So I kind of leave it there and pass it back to Olivier, maybe take questions from, from the line from the floor. Thank you very much, Derek, and thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, just because you're running this blindly, I've left it on consultation questions set out in the document. I don't have to, do I have to go further in the uh, slide deck or not? Uh, no, that should be fine. Okay, perfect. And um, the slide deck, of course, will be made available on our website as well. But now we're opening the floor for questions. And there are two ways that you can ask questions uh, or make comments, either by uh, putting your hand up in the participants list. So you'll find you can put your hand up and I'll be able to see this on my screen and then give you the floor. Uh, the other way is to write your questions in the uh, Zoom group chat, um, which uh, you can send and, and write and uh, then I can pick up, if you're unable to speak, I can pick it up and. Uh, ask the question or make the comment on your behalf. 
Whilst people are gathering their thoughts, I had one question um, with uh, uh, regarding the retailers uh, ensuring yeah. that the packaging had the the right labeling, etc. Uh, you mentioned retailers, online retailers. You mentioned uh, high street retailers. Um, what about retailers? As you know, you know the internet being international or global. What about retailers that sell from from outside the UK? So people that purchase goods uh, directly uh, in states or elsewhere. Um, how would you be able to address things uh, with that? Yeah, that's a really good question and something we're very well aware. We haven't addressed that in the consultation. Um, one, we wanted to kind of get a view from industry and how it kind of works already at the moment when it comes to kind of products in general and product safety. Um, our kind of um, view on it at the moment is retailers kind of selling into the country, as it were, is that if they're selling into the UK market, they have to adhere to the UK legislation. And there's then enforcing bodies, if we look at you know, product safety, for example, there's UK enforcing bodies like trading standards in place and customs that as soon as you import the good into the country, it has to either be inspected or meet certain requirements or anything like that. Um, so kind of our assumption when we were starting this piece of work is it would run like that. Now, what we're really kind of aware of is that in this space, smart goods space, if we're asking, you know, whatever enforcement agency it is to ensure that the product is compliant with security requirements, that might not, not necessarily be so, you know, easy to, easy to identify if you're not technically proficient or anything like that. So a default password, if it's not mentioned on the box, where else would it be kind of thing? Kind of how would that work in practice? Um, and kind of who would be kind of best place to take that. So that's kind of part of the enforcement thing that we're um, consulting on. But our kind of main assumption starting this work was that, you know, any retailer or any person selling into the UK market would have to adhere to UK law. Um, and that's why we've left things like purposely high level, like, you know, the manufacturer just self assess that it's compliant and things like that. So we actually want to know kind of, in real life, how does that process work? You know, how do you assess that the product, you know, is relatively either secure or compliant with a certain standard, and then how do you communicate that then to the retailer and communicate that to the consumer? Kind of what are the costs involved here and stuff like that? Because it's, it's all well and good us just saying, oh, um, you know, the product comes into the country, uh, kind of it has to adhere to UK law, and if not, an enforcement agency will sort it out. But kind of in reality, kind of what are the costs involved with kind of the, the current landscape as it were with product safety and things like that, kind of what are the, what are the issues around enforcement, you know, and, and capacity at enforcement levels to be able to do meaningful market surveillance on things coming into the country. Um, that's like a long-winded way of saying kind of we're very much consulting on that bit. We, yeah, before the we get selling that's something we need to build up more in our evidence base and in the consultation itself. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, just before I open the floor completely, I see hands coming up now. Uh, you mentioned an enforcement agency. Is there an enforcement agency for these things? Um, so at the moment, uh, not specifically for you know cyber security of IoT products and anything like that. Um, I was using the product safety example just really as a comparison because, you know, similar thing where products are being shipped into the country as it were, or delivered into the country, and what kind of, from a safety, the health and safety perspective, kind of what checks they'd have to go through and the enforcement agencies that carry out those checks. Um, but so kind of, a question kind of an excise as such, or, or uh, it could be a consumer um, a safety agency. Exactly, yeah, and that's something we're consulting on too, like who would be best placed to undertake that? Um, yeah, and that's kind of one of the questions in the consultation too, kind of what agency existing or a brand new agency would be best placed to undertake any sort of market monitoring or enforcement in this space too, to actually have a meaningful and effective enforcement regime, you know? Yep. Um, first of all, thank you um, for a very interesting and useful consultation. 
briefing. It was very helpful to get this. Um, one of the one I think you touched on it a little bit actually looking at it internationally, uh, Olivier. But uh, one on slide nineteen, um, it looks like the retailer uh, is really the focus um, ultimately in the UK context. Um, but also the retailer is, is expected to somehow self accredit to assign or use the label. Um, I just wanted to check that A, that, that, that is the situation. And then um, it was sort of rather brushed over a little bit. Uh, if What happens then? I mean, obviously, we think it's going to be some kind of accreditation agency or, uh, I mean, how, how, how would this work? Is anybody in the UK already qualified to do this sort of work? Um, that's that's the kind of drift of, of, of my question. Okay. Um, yeah, so on the retailer point, um, very much uh, the aim of the game for us is, you know, retailers can't sell these products. If we go with, for example, option A with the label, they can't sell a product that doesn't have a label on it. In terms of the retailer doing their own, you know, due diligence on the product, to know it, it, you know, is compliant with those three requirements kind of thing. Kind of, we've purposely kind of left it high level enough that we kind of want retailers themselves to feedback on the process and how it works now. And kind of, I've had really interesting conversations with retailers and retail organizations in the past couple of weeks um, to find out kind of in their normal day-to-day -day work uh, and lives, for example, kind of when it comes to product safety and how that kind of what exists at the moment in terms of retailers having doing their own due diligence on the products they sell. Uh, we're kind of thinking about it from a liability point of view, you know, if you're a retailer sells a product that is found to be unsafe, kind of if the, from the consumer's point of view, who is the consumer's beef with? Is it with the retailer or is it with the manufacturer? And kind of, I've been talking to retailers trying to ascertain kind of how does that work in practice? I've been getting kind of a variety of messages in terms of, you know, a lot of the cases, in the first instance, the consumer has to go to the manufacturer and kind of take off the issue with the manufacturer. Um, the retailer kind of is just the middleman, as it were. And kind of, I've then been hearing from other retailers that kind of the whole kind of ethos of uh, the retail sector is, you know, not to sell harmful or unsafe products. Um, and obviously kind of when we talk about kind of insecurity and stuff like that, that would fall into that same category too. So it's been really interesting kind of hearing how retailers think it would work in that process and kind of we're expecting kind of really thorough feedback on that in the future. Um, on the kind of accreditation point and stuff like that, it's interesting you raised that. So I said in presentation, like we've left the whole self assessment thing really high level because we really just, we want to get a feel from industry and kind of experts like yourself, like how does it work now? and what would be a sensible approach to how it works too. The accreditation thing has been raised before, it was raised last week when I presented to a tech association too. Um, that's something kind of we need to, as a policy team, kind of sit down and work through the feedback on to develop kind of our own position on that. Um, but kind of at this point in time, I know this is an unhelpful answer, but it's purposely, it's unhelpful simply because kind of we want to get a feel from industry and how it would work. And then we can use that to inform kind of a worked out policy answer on that to kind of then test in this industry again to see, make sure kind of we're hitting the right notes. It's a sensible approach. It's not too onerous what we're doing and it's not going to cost a vast amount of money for a large amount of, for example, retailers and manufacturers to do it, especially on the smaller end of the scale too. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for this, uh, Dareg. Next is the question from Eleni Panagu, and the question is as follows. Um, how, how is the IEEE standard 802.11 related to or embedded in the Etsy standard 103645? Is there any significant cor correlation? Um, I must just kind of hold my hand up and be honest. Um, I'm not the tech, standard technical expert within the team on SC or anything like that. Um, kind of, my colleague Jasper Panza has been leading that work and kind of has been ensuring that with the SC work, it's all kind of plugged into the under, other standards work, work going on at the moment. Kind of, 
across the standards world. Um, I'm more than happy if Olivier, if you're able to send me that question, um, to pass on to my colleague, who can then kind of only get back in contact with you directly to answer that, because I, I won't even pretend to try and answer that at this point. Apologies. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, uh, Eleni, if you drop a note to contact at isoc-e.org, we'll follow this over to Darig and he'll put you in touch with Jasper Panda um, or, or provide you with the response um, that, that works with that. Okay, any uh, other questions? Christian de la Renaga, your hand is up. I'm sorry to ask a supplementary question. Um, one question I have is really to look at whether you're thinking about how the consumer interacts uh, in the future. So over a period of two years, there'll be some kind of voluntary system of labeling. So there'll be a period of time where there'll be some people labeling, other people not labeling, um, and they'll be self-assessing the retailers as to what labels they're putting on. How, does, how do you envisage consumers um, Feedback? Uh, are, there, are, are there going to be feedback? That's, are you expecting consumers to go back to the retailers uh, primarily, who are sort of self-accredited, or are you expecting consumers to have some other avenue um, to I don't have complaint or question of, of some description? Yeah, that's a fantastic point, and kind of something internally, kind of we're really aware of when it comes to kind of our work in general in terms of evaluating it kind of from the consumer point of view. Kind of the end goal is protect the consumers, make give them more, kind of more transparency and allow them to make more informed purchasing decisions. Like how do you actually test whether that's working or has worked, for example? Um, we've kind of we have plans to do kind of consumer campaigns and things like that going forward. Um, last year we published consumer guidance. Um, I think from our perspective one, we don't want to basically deviate from what else is happening in the world and consumer IoT and stuff like that. I say that because we don't want to be giving the consumer, your standard run of the mill consumer, a bunch of mixed messages, stuff going on, standards, stuff like that, that they you know, either won't understand necessarily or care about. Um, and kind of try and boil it down into kind of a simple thing where like, Take the label for example it's just a simple label that the consumer can see and understand and the negative label for example with the x on it is something simple the consumer can understand totally appreciate kind of in this voluntary space that i've talked about with the label if you launch it on a, as a voluntary thing kind of you know we're realistic enough to know that a large majority of manufacturers aren't going to voluntarily put a label with a big red cross through it on their product they won't do that unless they absolutely have to. That's why kind of stuff like consumer campaigns and stuff like that and comms and messaging is really, really important from our perspective. And something kind of we've earmarked in our kind of work on for the next year and a couple of years after that too. So that's something we really need to kind of ramp up to. It's all well and good that we're doing all this in the regulation space and we're doing all this in the standard space and stuff like that. But I think, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there in terms of the end user and the result kind of Will they know what they're buying? Um, will they care? And kind of how do they navigate through the minefield that is all these standards and stuff coming out and government guidance and things like that? When at the end of the day, they just want to buy the product. Um, so it's really kind of trying to address all the challenges in a complicated way with the end result being quite a simple solution that you know everyone can understand, which, yeah, is no mean feat. But, um, yeah, it's definitely something kind of going forward we'll be looking to kind of evaluate stuff like that. Um, just to flag as well, I'm just kicked out of my room in DCMS. Um, so I don't know if there's any more questions for this. There are no further questions, Darek. It's Olivier Capanoblon speaking. So uh, it's just uh, time for me to thank you very much uh, for this. Um, actually, I, I do know there is one more question. I don't know whether you have time for that or yeah, sure. it's really so bad you that you're unable to speak. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'll be answer. So this is a, uh, actually there are two questions. The first one is from uh, Ken, 
Um, and the question is, are you consulting with companies focused in the IoT security industry, um, uh, like Device Authority or UK US based leader in IoT for consumer industry and medical devices, etc., where security can be a matter of life and death? Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier on at the start um, when we were trying to like ascertain what is in the consultation, and we've made it very clear that stuff like medical IoT and industrial IoT is out of scope. We totally appreciate kind of when it comes to IoT, there's a bit of a blurred line that you know some things might be applicable in medical IoT, for example, and some things might not be. We're working closely with you know, policy counterparts in Department for Health, for example, in the UK, um, to ensure kind of anything we're doing is, you know, not um, negatively impacting on their work. And as they would have all kind of the kind of main relationships with the medical IoT players in this space, like that kind of we're expecting, and we know that they're kind of communicating that to their stakeholders too. Uh, but yeah, I think, it's, it's a really fair point, uh, I think, by because IoT by its nature is so wide ranging. Uh, like, take industriality, for example, there's obviously some sort of a crossover. I think for us, kind of, we've made it pretty clear that consumer IoT is our focus, um, but kind of have then just gone on and ignored everything else. But more of a case of those teams within UK government, for example, that are leading on things like medical and stuff like that well aware of our work, they're plugged in, they're part of the policy process too. So that kind of what we're doing doesn't put any unintended consequences where, as you say, they're kind of, when it's life or death, um, you know, we, we don't want to be inadvertently causing that, as it were. Okay, thanks for this. And finally, the last question uh, that I see here is from Helen Louise Jansen. And the question is, when a consumer buys an IoT, device with a risk label and harm occurs due to use by the consumer, who is then to be held responsible and liable? What are the legal consequences from the labels and from the consumer use of unsafe uh, devices? Can a consumer be held liable? So can a consumer be held liable if their device is insecure? If, if a device is exactly. labeled as being unsafe and then they use it and then something right, yeah. goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and that's literally one of the questions kind of we've been kind of putting to industry and stuff like that and also to legal. Um, it's a really, it's a really interesting uh, kind of legal theoretical argument and stuff like that. And we're well aware kind of we need to really kind of develop our thinking on that in that space. Um, and yeah, liability in general, like I, I think it's a really fair question in terms of, you know, if you have the manufacturer selling the product with a negative label on it and actively doing that. You have the retailer actively selling the product with a negative label on that and the consumer actively buying it with a negative label on that. Kind of, yeah, where does liability lie? Um, and like, I'll be honest, we're very much in, you know, the early stages as far as the conversation on that point. Um, kind of, these are the questions that, this is why kind of our lawyers hate me because these kind of questions are kind of put to them, um, theoretical stuff. To kind of, you know, as part of the consultation, feedback, um, we're kind of analyzing that. And I mentioned in the slide, kind of, we'll be uh, working through legal as well. It will literally be, you know, workshops where we've just got lawyers in the room pitching these kind of questions at them, um, as well with kind of um, other in, kind of industry experts trying to ascertain kind of in traditional UK law, for example, where does the liability fall in that scenario? Um, it's, yeah, really good question. Um, like, if you could actually do that as part of your info, as part of your formal response, that'd be really helpful. Then that's something I can put to lawyers and say, you know, we see these, these kind of questions. Um, what's our position on it? Okay. Well, thank you very much for spending the time to explain this cons consultation to us. Understand the closing date for this is the fifth of June. And what happens afterwards? What would be, once, once that is done, what's the next thing afterwards? 5th of June, and then I have the lucky task of uh, collating every single piece of feedback and then spending the next few weeks with multiple teams across governments uh, and industry experts uh, pouring through the feedback 
um, kind of uh, analyzing each piece, incorporating it then into kind of our final work, things like that. In terms of a response to it, um, in line with kind of government guidelines here in the UK, uh, we'll be publishing a response. I think it's within three months is um, the deadline to do so. That response will literally set out kind of what the next steps are, what option we're proceeding with, how we're going to deliver that option, what will enforcement look like, what will things like liability, you know, what will that look like? Um, we're well aware kind of this isn't something that can be completely done and dusted in a month's time. Um, and there's going to be kind of another round of engagement needed and consultation needed as well, whether it be a formal consultation or more so kind of we use the consultation responses and kind of links from this current exercise to kind of inform of, okay, who do we need to speak to going forward for the next couple of months to really work up the, this specific area of our plans and stuff like that. So kind of, yeah, formal government response in a couple of months time, but kind of literally now and beyond the 5th of June, um, definitely kind of loads and loads of engagement, loads of internal policy work um, like that. And kind of before anything is voluntarily launched, um, there'll be kind of rounds of engagement like this too, um, kind of to, to get people's feedback and get people's kind of support as well. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. And thanks to your team also for this consultation. It's not the first one. It's, I think, the, is it the second one, isn't it? Because there was the previous one before. It is, yes. Yeah, second one in a year. Yeah. Second one in a year. So good luck on, on receiving all the answers. I hope that this has been helpful to everyone uh, on this call. Um, we're interested in, in ISOC uh, uh, England in your feedback on this webinar. Uh, we're interested in how you heard about this webinar. So contact at isoc-e.org. Uh, is the uh, the um, uh, the email address if you've got any feedback on this, and uh, also we have uh, we're going to take the recording here and put it on our website as well uh, in the relevant section. So uh, it will be up, uh, I would say, hopefully within a few hours. I don't know how long it takes. And we probably have to sort of convert it or something, and then we'll put it over uh, on the website. So um, with this, um, I think that there might be a consolidated response from the chapter and uh, the uh, an ISOC um, global, um, or at least the European Bureau. But that's another thing that we'll follow up with in the next few days. And um, I think that's all uh, I need uh, to let you know about. We're actually eight minutes, nine minutes past the top of the hour. So I'm sure people are busy um, wanting to do other things. So thanks again. Thanks for attending. And this call is now over, and we'll certainly have follow-ups in the future about this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you. Bye.